Hello, everyone, and welcome to Asino Resources Live Investment Summit today, hosted by Six. I'm joined today by Haya Don, Asino's CEO. Haya is going to walk us through his company presentation, and after which, we'll move on to a live Q&A session, where we'll be accepting and answering some questions. You can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. And as always, the summit is being recorded. It'll be available to watch afterwards on Six.com. And without further ado, Haya, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great, Cam. Thank you very much. And thank you, Six. Um, I believe we've got a large turnout here. So I've got about 17, 18 slides. I will try to race through them so that we leave enough time for Q&A because, um, as I said, um, we, we have a lot of people on the call. Uh, but before I do that, of course, you know, this presentation is going to be focused on RPA. But just for those people who um, don't know the, or, or don't know that much about the company yet, I'll just give a brief introduction. So Sino Resources is a gold exploration and development company active in Namibia. We recently, about two years ago, made a very exciting discovery called Twin Hills, which is being developed in leaps and bounds and has now resulted in this PEA. Um, we've done something like this in Namibia before. We previously owned another project, which we ended up selling to Beach Gold, who um, turned that very successfully into a very large uh, project called Achikoto. And Osino really is um, our attempt to try and do that again. Um, I just uh, point out to you this disclaimer, uh, which is specifically relevant to the PEA. Um, there's another disclaimer at the end of the presentation dealing with forward-looking statements. So in summary, um, we made this discovery. We are fast-tracking it. And we're very excited about the results of this PEA, which I will be uh, presenting to you shortly. Uh, we have not done this, or we're not doing this for the first time. We've done this before. We've created significant value before in Namibia and elsewhere. In my case, I'm, I'm the CEO and co-founder of this company. I'm a Namibian citizen, so obviously know my way around the neighborhood over here. We have very strong banking and investor support, well-financed, um, which has enabled us to, to fast-track this project. Uh, being in Namibia is, of course, special because it's a, a, a low political and social risk. And we have a, a very good share structure, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. So in summary, um, we're about $130 million market cap company. We have 110 million shares out after the recent warrant exercises. Um, we still have some warrants outstanding, which um, may be uh, accelerated in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, and we have about $13 million in cash in the bank right now, um, which is comfortably enough well into next year um, to execute our very active work program. Uh, a very nice blended uh, share structure with a mix of insiders, Ross Beattie still the largest shareholders, um, together with the founders, um, and, and then a bunch of respected um, North American institutions, plus a very good sprinkling of retail and high net worth in there. We've had a respectable share price performance, um, especially relative to our peers. Um, and as you can see, the share price has traded somewhat defensively, which we're pleased about. And I think that's a reflection of the growing awareness of the quality of our project um, and also the reducing risk profile of this project, which this PEA um, is also uh, demonstrating. So in summary on the PEA, um, we're very pleased about it. Uh, we believe that it represents a simple, economically very robust and attractive open pit gold project. Um, it has low technical risk, especially because of its geological consistency and metallurgical simplicity with a very low capital intensity and reasonable operating costs in an excellent location. Uh, we also think that the project has excellent upside potential, which we look to deliver over the next um, six to 12 months. Summary metrics, um, it's got a, an excellent life of mine of 15 years with a processing capacity of about three and a half million tons per annum. That's a fairly large sized operation. Um, just to put that in context, it's a bit bigger than what Ochikoto, which is our proxy in our neighboring mine in Namibia, uh, was at feasibility. We've got a very pleasing recovery in excess of 90%, which resulted in a production profile of, of just over 100,000 ounces, 124,000 ounces for the first few years. Um, and about 100,000 ounces per year for the life of mine. Cash costs are reasonable. 
um, and capital at 176 million before contingency is industry leading uh, in terms of its capital intensity. So that, that's been very, very pleasing. Um, and I think if you look at the undiscounted cash flow number there at, at just over spot gold prices of more than a billion dollars, that's really a testament to the bulkiness of this project. Of course, that's um, on an undiscounted basis. Um, if you look at it on an NPV basis, i.e. discounted at uh, more, um, you know, lower gold prices of 1700 and on a post-tax basis, we still have a very credible NPV of 377 million US dollars with excellent RRRs and paybacks. You can see in the graph below there, that's a cash flow waterfall on an undiscounted basis. And I included that just to show you where the profitability uh, lies and also where the costs lie. So you can see the attractive uh, cash flows in the early stage of the project. Um, that, that's the bar above the zero line there. You can see that the costs are comprised mainly of the mining costs. Um, processing costs a little bit less. These are these are absolute um, annual values that I'm talking to you about. And you can also see the effect of taxation over there. Namibia does have fairly high corporate tax rate at 37.5%, but it's got very attractive um, depreciation allowances, which um, mitigate that higher tax rate somewhat. Um, and of course, royalties, export levies, all these things you see in other projects as well. In Namibia, these are tax deductible, which is another benefit um, and, and enables us to mitigate that somewhat. Okay, on the development studies, the PA was concluded by Lycopodium, which is, I consider them Africa's leader in terms of study management and project construction. Uh, they've, they've, they've designed and built a number of projects, if not most of the West African comparable gold projects in Africa. And so they're, they're highly competent and highly, highly credible. Um, they worked with a range of specialist consultants um, for the resource, mine planning, environmental, and all the other uh, specialist technical disciplines. Um, these studies are ongoing. The PA is just the first step. I mentioned to you that we expect significant um, uh, ongoing de-risking and improvement of the project going forward. And that is that is ongoing at this time. So just to give you a bit more detail on the PEA itself and the, um, the production profiles, if we start at the top right there, that's a gold production profile. Uh, on an annual basis, if you look at those yellow brown bars, so you can see the annual production rate around 120,000 ounces in the early years. You can see a bit of a dip from about year eight, nine, 10. Um, of course, there is scope to improve this uh, by bringing forward some of the production in the later years. But nevertheless, 15 years at 100,000 ounces average um, for, our, for this PPA, uh, PEA is very credible. Uh, if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, just to drill down a little bit more, um, that shows you the mining tons at 25 million tons per annum. That's the brown bars again. That's fairly fairly small still. I think there's scope to improve this. The reason this is relatively low at this stage is um, because we were worried about um, having too much mining capital um, because, you know, when, when the PEA was created, it's a, it's a sequential process. So the mine planning had commenced um, when the capital cost estimate on the, on the process plant hadn't been concluded. So now that we know that the total capex is so low, we know that we can add mining capex and increase that mining rate substantially, which will help us bring forward some of the production in the later years um, and which will improve the economics. You can also see, maybe I'm going into a lot of detail here, but um, a lot of people are aware of our clouds discovery, which is a the high grade discovery that we made um, uh, at the sort of late last year, early this year. And you can see on that top left graph, the light blue, uh, very small contribution that clouds has made so far to the life of mine plan. We expect that to, to get bigger and to improve substantially as we, as we go forward. Um, if you look at the uh, mill feed, three and a half million tons per annum, the bars, and then I'm looking at the, by the way, I'm looking at the uh, bottom left diagram there. And then you see the dotted lines, that's the grade, the red one, and the green dotted line is the cutoff grade. So this indicates to you 
the conservative high grading that takes place through cut of grade optimization. Now, this is a standard practice in these type of open pits. Um, the way we've done it so far is relatively conservative and we believe um, there's scope to, to be more aggressive on this, which will improve the economics further as well. Um, but on average, as you can see, a mill feed grade for most of the life of mine between about 0.9 and 1.2 grams per ton. Uh, on the bottom right, the stockpile balance, that's important because you achieve this high grading that I referred to earlier through stockpile management. And you can see that the peak stockpiles go up to just under 10 million tons, which is quite quite manageable. Um, in the next iteration of feasibility studies, which, which we believe um, we will deliver in the first half of next year, I expect that the higher um, mining rate will bring forward gold production and will also increase those stockpile balances. So um, that's all good and that's going to improve the economics of the project further. So if we look at mine design and uh, mineral resources, at the top left, you can see um, the designed pit or three pits, bulge, twin hill central and clouds, which we've um, referred to. That's where the mineral resource comes from. And you can, you can see the sections for each of those, um, which, which by the way, I know they're quite small in this presentation. You can refer to them on the website um, later in the presentation. I've got individual slides for each of these sections. But really the story I'm telling here is that since the resource, which came out in April, um, which we used for this PEA, um, the assumptions that have gone into this PEA have been somewhat more conservative and that's, that's normal practice. Um, so if you look at the slope angles at the bottom there, for example, the, if you compare the PEA pit design with the resource pit design, um, you can see how through the introduction of ramps, um, the slope angles have gone down quite a bit on the one hand. Um, and on the other hand, you can also see how uh, significant resources were left behind in inverted commas. Now, this is normal, normal for uh, when you transition from resources to PEAs. In our case, our resource had a combined 1.9 million ounces of inferred and indicated. Now, um, or I should rather say 1.5. 4 million ounces of inferred and about four or 500,000 ounces of indicated resources. Um, the PEA produces a total of about between 1.4 and 1.5. So that's, that's 400,000 ounces of extra resources which are left behind is visible in these sections here. And of course, the next uh, phase of studies um, and the additional drilling, which we're currently doing both infill and expansion drilling, um, is aimed at bringing a lot of those resources back into the mine plan through optimization of the mine plan, but also adding additional resources, um, which will enable us to um, improve this mine plan further, basically add answers, add production, and extend the mine life. Um, I've added the saddle section. We haven't spoken much about that in the, in, in the past, where you can see um, quite significant uh, extra ounces um, seem to be discovered through our infill drilling, which is ongoing at the moment. And at clouds as well, you can see the blue holes here um, indicating significant additional resources at depth, which we've highlighted in some of the press releases that went out in the last few weeks. And um, further results are expected to demonstrate this further. So therefore, in summary, we think uh, in terms of mine design and mineral resources, uh, we believe that there's significant scope to improve this PEA further from um, the very attractive numbers, which it already has. On the next slide, metallurgical test work. So um, we have done multiple rounds of MET test work over the last a uh, year or so, uh, much more so than would ordinarily be the case for a PEA. We are already deep into the optimization stage. Um, as the diagram at the bottom left-hand side indicates, for each successive phase of leach test work, recoveries have improved. Um, we have applied various um, optimization steps, such as evaluating different grind sizes, um, different leach retention times, adding pre-oxidization, et cetera, all of which 
is finding fine tuning the recovery. We use 90.8% as a blended average recovery for the PEA, um, but we do think that with ongoing optimization, there's there's potential to um, to improve this uh, further going forward. The mineralized material is uh, uh, um, characterized as medium to hard by by the QP by Lycopodium, um, and it is amenable to standard three stage crushing and ball milling. And this is this is really something that sets this PEA apart. Is that the um, the processing route is really off the shelf stock standard, very simple. Um, we have done initial gravity recovery test work. And of course, everybody's very interested in this because this has been highly successful at Ochikoto, which is the neighboring mine to us. But our test work in that context so far has been promising, but not definitive. So work is ongoing in that context. This indicates the process plant layout um, comprising what we believe is the optimal circuit layout now that comprises three stage crushing over here in the top left in the green box, followed by uh, ball milling, pre oxidization, and CIL. Um, that's a very standard process with um, electro winning and smelting at the end. Something that I guess is slightly unique, but not, um, not difficult or not new, is a dry stack tailing step position. This um, was considered and or we believe this is the optimal um, tailing slip position uh, strategy to use for this project owing to its lower water consumption which in a, in a dry country like Namibia is of course key um, and it has some other advantages so um, that's that's what um, what the process plant layout is uh, on the next slide the site layout this, um, I've, I've got the picture there on the left hand side with a lot, a lot of you know, which gives you the lay of the land. And you can superimpose this uh, detailed site layout that we have created. Um, I believe this is one of the key benefits of this project um, is its vanilla location. We are within 20 kilometers of an established mining town within 25 kilometers of another gold mining operation, Navahab. We are five kilometers from a sealed surface road. We have all utilities close by, easy uh, topography, no communities to relocate, no camp to build. And this is the reason really that our capital costs are so low, um, you know, with that industry leading capital intensity that I referred to earlier. Um, we also are far down the line with securing the surface, surface rights that comprise this entire project. And um, you, you will hear about that, uh, you know, in, in, in the next couple of weeks. So all in all, a very simple site layout. You can see the pit in the center there. You can also see the um, exploration upside um, towards the bottom left. That's the corridor that's been left open there. Waste rock and tailings co-deposition. That's the dry stack tailings um, and otherwise a standard um, layout. So in terms of capital costs, 175 million before contingency. Uh, this reflects the excellent local project setting that I was talking about earlier on. Um, and also quite competitive operating costs, which reflect Namibia as a highly attractive operating environment with weak exchange rates um, and or weak exchange rate and a very well developed local mining and services industry with staff um, and uh, suppliers, etc., close by. These costs were benchmarked against the other two Namibian gold mines. You know, we use um, some very credible consultants that helped us do that. Um, so, in terms of the processing costs, uh, nine dollars per ton. This is somewhat lower than Ochikoto, um, and administration costs three dollars per ton GNA. That's standard, and mining costs average of about two point one US dollar per ton which I think um, stacks up well against the other operations. Uh, processing costs are broken down here as well. Um, and uh, so we are comfortable that these are um, achievable. Uh, of course, bear in mind that this is a PEA stage and there's, a, there's an estimating accuracy of plus or minus 35% applied to this. So I'm not gonna go into detail on the financial model. Um, that's, this was in the press release. Uh, just to say that our cash costs of 850 
seven US dollars per ounce is in line with the other operations. It's a bit higher than Ochikoto. It's in line with Novachop, which is our neighboring mine. And um, all in sustaining costs, not much higher. Um, and generally highly attractive economics. So where are the areas of growth? We believe that this PEA has put Twin Hills on the map as a, as of course, as it, as it stands, as an attractive and economically a highly viable project, but it does have significant scope for growth through ongoing drilling and project optimization. In particular, on the resources side, you know, we've got 10 drill rigs going, uh, doing infill and step-out drilling at the moment. We're waiting to conclude that drill program and to receive all the SA results. That will be done probably by about October, uh, November this year. Um, by that stage, we would have just about doubled the drilling rate. The, the, the resource currently has about 69,000 meters of drilling. And uh, by October, November, we should have another 60, 70,000 meters of, of, of drilling um, that, that should have gone into the project, of which probably around 50,000 meters would have been resource type drilling, i.e. infill and step-out drilling. Um, that should result in additional ounces being delineated and potentially also, because of the better de definition, um, enable us to use more advanced resource estimation techniques, which could result in a higher grade. Um, there's also intensive ongoing near pit exploration, what we refer to as brownfields exploration, which is ongoing uh, with some very encouraging early signals. So there's still the potential to uh, make a game changing discovery in the uh, close radius of the existing pits. On the mining side, there is very good potential to reduce stripping through pit design optimization, like for example, reviewing the ramps, um, trying to steepen pit slopes and so forth. Um, and then the higher mining rates, which we envisage um, using higher capital, um, more equipment, possibly larger equipment, um, and, and also using or bringing in a capitalized pre-strip would result in bringing forward of production um, and getting us closer to increasing the gold production rate on an annual basis to from 120 to maybe closer to 150,000 ounces um, with all of this optimization. On the processing plant side, same thing. So the 3.5 million tons per annum is already a large mine, but um, given or, or, or subject to uh, delineating additional ounces and having a higher mining rate, we could potentially increase the process plant throughput um, and then added to that ongoing process optimization with, with potentially slightly higher recoveries um, could result in increased production. So I've added this graph on the bottom left hand side there where you see those additional pink and green bars to the gold production graph that I went through earlier. And this is just to show you how, in inverted commas, relatively easy it will be to get to 150,000 ounces of production, which is my personal vision for this project. Um, so the pink is um, what would get us from 120 to 150. That's about 30,000 ounces per year for 10 years, adds up to 300,000 extra ounces. And the green is the 150,000 ounces required to fill that kind of production dip between year seven and 10. Um, so that together is 450,000 ounces of extra, extra gold. Um, if you assume that we can bring forward about 230,000 ounces, which is that year 12 to 15 production, um, that would then only leave you with about 220 to 240,000 ounces of extra resources, which in the context of our current inferred and indicated resource of, of 1.9 million ounces does not seem to be such a stretch. Um, so I'm belaboring this point just to demonstrate to you how much um, uh, production growth potential this project has. And if we were to get to 150,000 ounces for 10 years in the next six to 12 months, um, I think we would really get into the sort of elite group of um, large uh, sort of mid-tier um, uh, gold mines out there. So a lot of scope for growth, and that's that's where I thought 
where our thoughts are going and with the with the development work that we're doing over the next um, uh, six to 12 months, um, this is where we're aiming to get to. So from a valuation perspective, um, if you just take into account our current uh, market cap and the 377 million US dollar NPV of the known project, i.e. not taking any of the growth that I've just outlined into account, we are currently trading at about between 0.3 and 0.4 um, price per NAV. I've adapted this slide from Ozone, um, and I've done that not just cheekily, but also because Ozone is such a good comparison for us. Because Ozone is, of course, a larger company to us. Their resource base is almost double of ours. Their grade is a bit lower. But geologically, they're very similar to us. Also, in terms of their development trajectory, they are very similar to us. So it's a very similar company. But they are, of course, probably about two years ahead of us. They are currently trading at a price per NAV multiple of 0.6. So if you look at that red arrow there for us, just through ongoing execution um, over the next you know, year or two, we should re-rate um, similarly. You can then add to that the, the improvement in the NPV, i.e. the denominator, which um, would obviously then result in a, in a much higher share price. So therefore, I think this is, this is one of the key aspects of Asino. I think we're a low-risk, re-rate um, opportunity uh, on ongoing execution and growth. And we have all the elements in place in order to deliver on that execution and growth. So before I get to the end and summarize this PEA, let me just say we've, we've, we have spent a lot of time and effort also on ESG, basically defining what does ESG mean to us. We, we know that this project is going to be strategic and game-changing for Namibia, just like B2Gold's Ochikota project was a game-changer for Namibia uh, seven years ago. Now, we firmly believe in sharing and building value for all, and in that context have um, come up with a well-thought-out ESG strategy. Uh, we've done material risk assessment. We've evaluated different... Um, reporting uh, codes that are out there, and we will be, we will shortly be publicizing our activities in this regard. Um, very recently, we founded the Twin Hills Trust, which was seed funded by Osino to the value of two hundred thousand Canadian dollars, which has already funded a range of strategic um, social development projects in Namibia, and we're starting to get uh, real traction and also some reputation locally in Namibia through that. So this is close to our heart and you'll be hearing more about this um, going forward. We'll be focusing more and more on this because we believe that ESG is essential in order to build the social license to operate in the uh, in the country and, and the community that we operate in. So in summary, um, before we open up to Q&A, we are extremely pleased with this PEA. I know um, that there have been some comments out there that people have said that maybe this PEA was too early, maybe we should have waited six months to um, to to grow it further and and only publish a PEI once we give it our best shot. But I think um, th we decided to do this differently. We we believe this PEA really puts Twin Hills on the map as an attractive, um, very exciting development project, um, which will be easy to develop with low capex. Uh, in a vanilla location with geological consistency, low technical risk and no fatal flaws um, and very significant upside potential, which we will look to deliver in the next um, six to 12 months through ongoing drilling, optimization of mine plans and metallurgy and also very aggressive ongoing exploration. So thank you very much. That's it in summary. I open up to uh, Q&A. Great, thanks, Aya. Yeah, we've had some uh, some great questions coming in so far. I'd just like to remind everyone in the audience that you can ask questions using the Q&A tab found on the right-hand screen. But Haya, let's get it started with a, a question that actually came in in advance of the summit. What makes this PEA special? How does it stand out from other recently published African Gold Developers PEAs? I think what makes it special is that it's very real. And what I mean by real is it is very durable. It has It has manageable capital very respectable economics and uh, production rates. 
Um, it's got the right size. It's got significant growth potential. Um, and I think it is going to be um, it is going to be delivered quickly, um, shortly after discovery. I mean, just to remind you, we only discovered this project two years ago, and I think in the next two years we will certainly be be in construction. So that's that's a that's an amazing trajectory, development trajectory, and I think that's what makes this PEA special. Great, awesome. Murray's asked uh, this question in the chat. Could you please talk a little bit about why PEA throughput is constrained to 3.5 mm TPA? Wouldn't it make more sense to expand in year four or five to 5 mm TPA and process the stockpiles earlier in the mine life? Could you also talk a little bit more about the impact that a 5 mm TPA throughput would have on clouds and deepening the other pits uh, and what that would have on the production profile? What the economics of uh, pit deepening look like? Of course, we don't know what the economics of the pit deepening looks like. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you a general answer, Murray. But first and foremost, why didn't we do it right out of the gate? Well, just to explain to uh, uh, you know members of the audience who might not be aware that mine planning, unfortunately, is a linear process. And so when we commence with this, with this uh, in order to fast track this PEA, we had to make some assumptions. Um, and we made those assumptions quite early on when we when we didn't even have a mineral resource yet. Um, that's when we pegged the three and a half million ton per annum throughput because we we thought we wanted to achieve about a 10 year life of mine because we believe that's kind of the the uh, respectability threshold. When the resource came out in April, um, that was fixed. Um, and a lot of the PEA work was far advanced and it was too late to change that. Having said that, if you look at the production profiles that I showed earlier, at this stage, um, three and a half million tons per annum is probably appropriate. Although, as Murray uh, pointed out, there are additional, significant additional answers which we expect to come into the future resource, but we haven't got them yet. So we've got to we've got to do the drilling. We've got to complete this extra work, and once that comes in, I have no doubt that the um, future production rate will be higher, and and a follow-on technical study will demonstrate that. All right, thank you, Aya. Eugene asks this. Given recent developments with deep south resources, loss of license or failure to renew, is Namibia, is Namibia a safe jurisdiction? Are you taking proactive precautions? Look, of course, um, everybody is aware what happened at deep south and, and, and you know, I can't talk on behalf of what happened to them. And certainly I don't want to speculate. I can just talk, what I own, talk about what our own experience has been and that has been very, very pos positive. I'm a Namibian citizen. I've operated in Namibia for, for more than 10 years as a entrepreneur and developer of projects. Um, I have never ha never encountered, um, uh, by, well, let, let me rephrase this. I have um, always encountered a highly constructive and helpful Ministry of Mines. I think it's very, very important that you um, fulfill your promises, uh, uh, that you have meet your work program commitments. And in our case, both the prior project I was involved when involved with, with uh, which which B2 Gold built and Osino, um, we always exceeded the promises that we made, and that um, the, the government appreciates that, and that's why um, our experience with the uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy and actually all regulators in Namibia has been very positive. So we have no reason to believe that there will be any issues. We're very happy to operate here. We believe it's a very safe jurisdiction in terms of um, physical safety, but also in terms of um, security of tenure and so forth. So we're very, very happy to operate here. Thanks, Aya. Nick wants to know what the key catalysts are over the next one to two years. So, the, okay, so the next six months, of course, lots of drilling. We've got 10 rigs on the ground. We, we, we're basically going to double the total amount of meters um, that has gone into the project. I mentioned the resource had 69,000 meters. We've already drilled another 40,000 meters and, and we will add another 20, 30,000 meters in the next few months. So it will get us to 120, 130,000 meters in this project. So that will bring with it ongoing drill results. In fact, there's some results uh, imminent. Um, and that will bring it with it also the ability to optimize the mine plan, um, to increase the throughput, to better define or, or to be more, more uh, discreet on resource estimation. So uh, therefore, in summary, I would say uh, draw results, ongoing technical studies for the next six months, 
uh, mining license application in the next few weeks, acquisition of surface rights in the next few months, which will substantially do risk the project, conclusion of environmental studies this in, in the next six months, and then the first half of next year will be um, advanced feasibility, financing, um, demonstrating bigger economics and moving towards construction. Okay, great. Um, Robert wants to know if there are any tax holidays and why is the sustaining capital so low? Okay, so first on the tax holidays, no. You know, what Namibia is unique in comparison to West Africa and that um, it's more like Canada and the US where mines operate according to a normal tax code. So I mentioned that in the beginning, we've got quite a high corporate tax rate of 37.5% but very attractive depreciation allowances. So for example, the um, $50 million of uh, pre-construction sunk costs, which would have gone into the project by the time we built, is fully depreciable, um, all the capex, et cetera. So that, that helps you bring down the, the average tax rate. If you look at this PEA, um, in total, the, the tax rate on, after, on, on profits is, is, is just below 30%. So that's more or less the effective tax rate that the project has. So, and I think that's fair and that's manageable. Um, the other question was, what was the other question? Sorry, I'm... Um, no worries, no worries. Um, just a question about the sustaining capital. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, a lot of people have asked me that. Um, what you must bear in mind is this, this mine or this project, the way it's built, can process all of the material. We have oxide and sulfide, but this process plant is laid out such that it can treat oxides and sulfides. Um, quite a few of the other projects that put out PEAs lately um, treat oxides initially, and then they build sulfide plants later on after a couple of years down into the uh, life of mine. And that is that is a real reason that some of those projects have these very high sustaining capital numbers. In our case, Sustaining capital is basically just maintenance capital, which we estimated at two percent of operating costs, which is which is a fair benchmark relative to um, to our neighboring Goldman Novichok, for example. Okay, uh, I think you touched on this earlier, Ahaya, but Deepmar wants to know about the relationship with the Ministry of Energy and Mines, uh, and just you know another question about how the situation with Deep South, uh, as far as you know, although you did touch on that earlier. Yeah, look, sorry, I, I'm going to keep it short. I can't comment on Deep South. I feel very bad for them. Of course, HYPE is a strategic project for Namibia, and everyone wants to see it developed. Um, in our case, we have excellent relationships with all regulators, um, very constructive. They are very helpful. Um, we are we are liaising with them on an ongoing basis. We, we have many licenses, I think, in total. I forget the number. We've got about 20 EPLs or more, um, and we have renewed them on a normal, on a, on a regular basis without any problems. So we, we have no complaints from a licensing um, uh, perspective. Very fine. Uh, Peter wants to know, what additional geotechnical investigation work do you have planned to enable pit slope optimization? I mean, the geotech work has been done to quite a high level of detail already. Um, and we are going to do more of that. We, we plan a round of geotechnical drilling um, into the actual PEA pit slopes in the actual locations where these slopes are, um, which, which might enable us to, to steepen the slopes, slopes a bit more. But the real potential, I don't want to call it a game changer, but a very significant change will come with the optimization of the ramp layout. I mean, the, in the main pit, we currently have four ramps, which is overkill, just a conservative approach. Um, we can likely reduce that to two, which will take out a substantial amount of waste stripping and will result in, in those pit pits going, going deeper. And we plan to do that going forward. So all in all, I think we've got an appropriate level of geotechnical work for this stage of study. But yes, much more geotechnical drilling and studies expected in the next six months. Right. Uh, Hubert wants to know, what is driving the low capex? I think uh, primarily the location. I call it the vanilla location because we are so close to infrastructure, we have no communities to relocate. So no um, resettlement action plans, no construction of mine villages. We have a local town, two local towns. One is 20 kilometers away, the other one is 60 kilometers away. We, have, we don't have to build any major roads. Our power line construction is uh, short. We, we link into the national grid for power. So all of these things, um, obviously have a major impact on, on capital. 
Secondly, exchange rate uh, is, is a big factor. You know, operating in Namibia, which 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 has the South African rand, um, and and just logistics. I mean, it's just a far cry, uh, or it's a major difference operating in Namibia to Ivory Coast or Burkina Faso or any of the West African countries. Obviously, huge difference, um, and I, I would say that's in summary the main reason for the low, much lower capital costs. All right, Neil wants to know what the average cost of mining uh, grams per ton is. Uh, okay, so we just got to get the definitions right. So the average mining cost on a dollar per ton mined basis is two dollars US dollars and eight cents. That's a blended cost for both ore and waste over the life of mine. Of course, as we go into the next stage of studies, we will we will refine this further. Generally, costs go up as you go deeper, but for PA level studies, we've assumed constant costs throughout the life of mine. Okay. Um, Michael wants to know what the timelines are for PFS, DFS, and production. So PFS, DFS, let me, and, and production, let me deal with that first. Um, in our case, we will try to leapfrog the PFS process. Usually, companies do PFFs primarily to um, firm up on process layout. Um, and uh, so in our case, we will try to leapfrog the PFS and leave it out altogether. The reason for that is because it will enable us to, to compress the timeline. And a lot of the PFS level work has actually already been done and is actually already incorporated into this PA. And that's why I said in this begin in the beginning, this is a very real, very real or a high quality PA. Um, so therefore, I don't foresee us doing a PFS. I I aim or we aim to conclude a de definitive level of study during the first half of next year. Um, and then follow that up immediately afterwards with what is called feed, front engine engineering and design. And you need that, that leads into construction. You need that in order to define your long lead items. Um, and once you've done that, then you, you can order those items and you can actually start construction. That's obviously still, obviously still subject to getting a money license. So if I take a step back, therefore um, the next nine months for advanced feasibility study, you know, hopefully up to definitive level, then probably another three to six months at most of feed, front end engineering and design. Uh, financing will, I'm, I'm talking project financing, debt financing and so forth will happen in parallel with that, probably commencing late this year, early next year. So if everything goes according to plan, uh, we might be able to initiate construction in the second half of next year. And typically, for projects of this size, construction period probably around 15 to 18 months. So um, therefore end of 2022, uh, early 2023, um, probably the end of construction and potential uh, first gold production. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael wants to know when you will be able to provide an update on the district scale exploration. Uh, I don't know exactly. It depends on the results. We have some results. Um, so I think in the next two to four weeks, you will see firstly, well, eminently drill results generally, infill drilling and step out drilling results on clouds and uh, Twin Hill Central and um, Bulge, followed up a few weeks later by Brownfields exploration update. We've had some very encouraging results, but um, we would like to put them in context with additional results, which we're waiting for. We've actually moved some rigs into the area. Um, so next couple of weeks, Brownfields exploration update. Great. Uh, Nick has another question. Can you discuss the competitive landscape in Namibia for gold production? Um, gold producers and maybe some developers or explorers as well. Yeah, so there are two producers. There's B2 Gold, of course, who have done such a fantastic job of, of not only building the Ochikoto Gold Mine, but also operating it. And um, they have, I, I thank them. I can't thank them enough because they've made my job um, so much easier to conceive of this idea and to promote this idea, what we are doing here with Asino. Um, so they are the sort of nameplate Namibian gold producer that's out there with the Ochikoto Gold Mine. Uh, which has many similar similarities to, to us and really is our guiding light. It's our aim. We want to be like them. And I think we will get there. Our grades are a bit lower. Um, our recovery is a bit lower, but our scale is similar and our exploration upside potentially is better. So I think we do have a, a chance of becoming like them. So that's the one. Second one is Novichok, which is 20 kilometers away from us, which is a well-established 
producer of 30 years, it's an open pit mine still in production, likely will, will um, undergo a change of ownership at some stage in the future um, and potentially has a lot of synergies with us. There are a range of additional explorers active, which people are aware of, but um, and, and we certainly will be the third gold producer in Namibia. Okay. Uh, Roland wants to know if you're contemplating raising any capital, debt or equity locally in Namibia. We would love to. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I could, I could spend an hour talking just about um, Namibia and what it has to offer. One of the things is a very large captive pool of local savings, which we would love to um, tap into. I think now that the project is getting to the development stage, um, this is possible. There's, there's development type funding available in Namibia. There are local pension funds and so forth. So um, we're very interested in that and we'll be engaging with local um, finance providers to uh, try and achieve that. So yes, I think I think now that the PEA is, is on the table and now that the project is, is moving towards um, true development, um, these discussions will be initiated. Great, awesome. Uh, Charlotte has a question. Can you please talk us through the rationale behind a 5% discount rate? It sounds a little low and real unrealistic. Well, I don't want to sort of bore the audience with the theory of like the capital asset pricing model, which, which tells you how to determine discount rates. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, the discount rate is obviously determined by the level of risk um, that the asset is subject to in Namibia. Um, I think a 5% discount rate is entirely appropriate. Um, if you look at the press release that we put out, we, we, we have indicated a sensitivity to discount rate. So if you're interested in, in looking at the project at a different discount rate, maybe 8% or so, you can do it. Even at 8% discount rate, our economics are still very attractive, but we're very comfortable. We think that a 5% discount rate for a project at the, um, or subject to the level of risk that, that ours is, financial risk that is, um, and others, um, five percent is appropriate. Okay, great. Uh, Roland actually has a follow-up question. Um, is there a risk that with a third mine and economies of scale in Namibia, there may be pressure to do further downstream value addition, refining to the gold? I know this is a very Southern African question because of the sort of degree of of, of resource. I don't want to call it nationalism; call it patriotism. So people have this. I believe it's a misguided conception um, that gold mines should refine further because, in effect. Gold mine processing is already a refining process or a beneficiation process, I should rather say. I mean, it's very hard to refine a Dore, which comes at 95, 97% purity, to refine that further. I mean, then you're talking about jewelry design, et cetera, et cetera, which is really outside of the ambit of mining companies. So, so my base case is no. I think it would be unreasonable to expect that of, of us, and I don't think that the government will expect us uh, to do so. Of course, we'll, we'll support it as best as we can, but we will be producing Dore and it very likely will be exported uh, for further refining either to South Africa or to Switzerland, which is kind of standard practice um, for, for Namibian gold mines. Great. Okay. Um, you know, hi, another question that came in ahead of time is, uh, as the founder of the company, what is your personal vision for the company? <laughs> so my personal vision is to turn this project into Namibia's gold mining champion. And I say that a little bit cheekily because of course, the current gold mining champion in Namibia is B2 Gold, um, and they have excellent production rates, excellent costs, excellent metrics, which um, if, we, if we were to beat them, which I guess is unlikely, um, that would make us a one or $2 billion company. Um, I mean, I'm talking valuation on a loose basis over here. But I think it is a, a good ambition. We, we don't want to be just a small brother to Ochikoto. We want to become like Ochikoto. So my vision certainly is to turn this into um the next major namibian gold mining operation i think we're well on the way to do that great uh, neil has a question what other minerals are in your resources nothing to really talk about we have a bit of silver but it is uh minimal it is uh, uh it, it, it comes out in the wash it's it's uh i forget the exact percentage but it's it's um not significant um other than that nothing really no no by byproducts in in um, in these type of resources. Right. Uh, Richard has a question. If you could touch on government elections, um, when is that next? And how would a change of government potentially affect you? 
Um, so, you know, Namibia is a, it's a one-party democracy, let me call it that. Um, the governing party, SWAPA, has been, has been in power uh, since independence in 1989, 1990. Um, but they have been very stable. They have had um, rule of law, um, you know, free elections. Um, and so we, we don't anticipate any major change in government going forward. Lately, um, in the last local elections, which were held last year, there were some changes at the local political level where sort of citizens movements, et cetera, uh, gained gain power in, in, in certain regions. And I think that was positive for democracy, but at the national level with the next election, we don't, we don't expect any, any changes. So we don't expect a change of government. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that's come in in advance is uh, regarding ESG. How does the Sino view it? And what are you doing or planning on um, about it? Yeah, so to be honest, I mean, in the beginning we didn't know what it meant uh, you know two or three years ago ESG is a is a is a fast event. so we appointed a very credible outside consultant to help us um, and to guide us through this process firstly to define what should it mean for us and secondly what to do about it how to measure it and how to how to report it so we spend a lot of time and, and effort in the background we haven't been very good at communicating it yet and we, we plan to change that but um, so, so we've come up with a strategy, an ESG strategy, what it means to us. We uh, did a material risk assessment quite intensively, um, and we evaluated the different kind of reporting codes that are out there from ICMM to Global Compact, et cetera, et cetera, um, including some very relevant Namibian reporting codes, like for example, the Namibian Best Practice Guide. Um, and we've, we've developed a template which we are working to report towards. Um, so that's ESG in general. On the, of course, you know, that's, there's environmental, social, and governance. In terms of governance, um, of course, Canadian corporate governance applies and Namibian corporate governance. But especially on the social side, uh, the voluntary social side, we've done a lot. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we've, we've formed a trust. We've seed funded it. We're looking to reach out to our suppliers brokers, financiers, some of the people on this call, uh, I'm going to get come and get you um, because we're looking to bulk up that fund in order to significantly bolster our social um, investment activities in Namibia. We've already funded a range of strategic uh, projects in housing, early childhood development, and so forth. So I believe we're very proactive, but we're looking to do much more on this score. All right. Thank you, Haya. Another question that's come in. Uh, what is the percent of insider holdings? Oi, you got me. Um, it is, uh, so Ross Beatty owns about 12%. Um, the founders and close associates own about another 8%. Um, RCF, which is our second largest shareholder, owns just under 10%. So I guess, technically speaking, they're not an insider anymore. I've, in that bar graph that's at the beginning of our presentation, I've included them in the 30%. But they're quasi insider. They haven't traded any shares whatsoever. So therefore, you could say probably around thirty percent of the company is held by insiders or very close associates, roughly. Okay, fair enough. Well, listen, hi. Uh, we're we're coming close on time at this point. Um, I think it's been a great Q and A session, but I definitely want to leave enough room at the end for you to you know leave your final remarks, so to speak, um, to the audience. If your question wasn't asked um, just because of the time constraints, or if you think of one after, we'll be sending out a survey where you can get in contact directly with the team here. Uh, and of course, you can always find more information at their website, asinaresources.com. Uh, and with that, Haya, I'd love to hear any final remarks you have for the audience today. Yeah, thank you very much. Before I do that, let me just point out, we have a new website, which I'm very proud about. It's bulked up, it's, um, it's, got a, it's been polished, and it's got a, some additional sections. Um, of course, this webcast will be there. The presentation with quite a lengthy appendix, which I haven't gone through in this webcast, will also be there, hopefully from tomorrow sometime. Um, and so I, I urge you all to go there and, and check it out. Um, so to maybe close off, let me just say I'm, I'm extremely excited. I think we have done very well to bring this project from nowhere to a very large very attractive, but also very simple and a very low risk uh, project. 
um, which is demonstrated by this PEA. Um, and this PEA has opened a, a window for a significant further improvement. And I can tell you, we've got a large team in Namibia, we're about 120 people by now. We are all beavering away feverishly to make this bigger and better over the next couple of months. So I think it's very exciting times ahead. And I have no doubt that with this ongoing um, de-risking and delivery, um, that our share price will will ultimately reflect um, the appropriate value. So I'm a big shareholder, um, and I, 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 you know, I'm, I stay in, and um, for to um, you know much much better days ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on, and I'd like to thank everyone in attendance as well. Uh, and have a Thank good you. day, everyone. Cheers.